Cecil Bork, uh, and there's my LinkedIn. I've been doing database backed app development for decades, and uh, but I'm mostly a developer, not a DBA database administrator. Although I've kind of had to do that too sometimes. Um, I've shipped a couple of iOS apps, but generally nowadays what I'm doing is working Java and building web apps with Java on the back end, and Postgres is the database. So, and I help little micro startups, so a little tiny companies doing niche software. So, if you ever have a business idea, talk to me. Um, so, the elephant stands. In that's the mascot, yeah. The blue elephant is the mascot for Postgres. No, for Postgres. Postgres. I don't know where it comes from. Maybe the thing about elephants never forget. Postgres is super reliable, it doesn't lose your data. Which is not true of all databases, but it is true of Postgres. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's the best database, but with the worst name. So there's a whole story behind the name, but if you forgive the name, you'll be very impressed with Postgres. So, uh, yeah, and like we have some world-class experts in that booth if you want to talk uh, to them. Um, or to me, as I said, more on the, the database development side, app development side. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, database uh, is an organized, structured way to track data about stuff. So if you're starting out with a database project, you look at the stuff, the things that you're trying to uh, keep track of. So basically, I'm mean, starting with the nouns. Uh, so if you're a veterinary office, you identify that you've got customers, you've got doctors, you've got visits, animals, and so on. If you're doing a dormitory thing, you're going to have students. You know you've got some physical rooms. And then sometimes there's these verb things we'll talk a little more about, like you know you assign a student to a room. Uh, that's the first step. Then you figure out that all those things have qualities or properties or attributes about them, and those are going to be what we call columns on a database. So we know books have something like a title, an ISBN number is a standard, international standard for book numbering. Uh, we know we'll have some kind of a description on them. Uh, if we're talking about an author for, for the books, we know that they're going to have a name, a phone number. Same thing, room, dorm room, we're going to have uh, which room number are we talking about, and then somehow identify the students. So once we figured that out, we're ready to actually put data in there. So this, for example, is the authors. We've got names. And this is why we call them columns, because we usually represent this kind of data as a row as each, each instance of, uh, of your uh, table definition is also called an entity uh, in programmer lingo. So uh, Lisa Coleman is an entity of, she's one author. Wendy's another, Jesse's another, and then we've got a couple of books. Uh, who some of these people wrote some of these books, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. Yes. So notice you have underscores after the table names and the columns. Yeah, is that a that's. Is that a requirement? Is no, that is my idea? own personal little I'll go with that. controversy going on. Actually, okay. I found out there's a note. Well, let me first say he's he's talking about all these names of my columns and my tables. So. Um, um, I, we actually have time to run a little long, by the way, if we want to talk, because there's no, uh, I think we're the last talk in this room. So, um, but I don't mean to keep you either, you can always leave. Um, but yeah, a momentary distraction here. The, I actually went to the bother of looking at the reserved keywords uh, and reserved uh, names, uh, words that are used by various different databases. Sure. There is a SQL standard I'm going to talk about. There's a SQL language with hundreds of words in it. Uh, actually, probably just dozens. But all the different databases add their own beyond that. Sure. They have all kinds of technical terms. So I actually went through one day, must have had too much coffee, and I made a list. I came up with over a thousand words. So the problem is a lot of your words are very common, you know, like type and, and play. I mean, there's all kinds of words. I was amazed at how often you could run into those where you're accidentally naming something here, uh, like the word probably name. <laughs> Certainly date, time, all kinds of, of words. And so then I noticed there was a mention in the Postgres docs about um, something about the keywords never end in an underscore. And I went and found out it's part of the SQL standard. It says that no keyword shall ever in any ver future version or current you have a trailing underscore. Okay. And I thought that's really odd. And to me it screamed out that, hey, if I put an underscore after all my names, I'll never have to worry about a collision. Because if you do a collision, if you use one, you may or may not have problems, depending on the situation. 
So um, anyway, it's controversy because then I published on the internet this idea and some people wrote back and they interpreted the spec as saying we shouldn't be doing that either. And I don't think they're reading the spec right because the spec is written at people who are making the database, not using the database. But so I'm kind of leaving that, I, I've done this, I do it all the time. I find it's very helpful because when you're programming an app, you're gonna use data from the database in your app. And so what you end up with is you've got an author object in your, like Java, for example. You've got an author object, and then you're printing, but that code has to get data from the database for the author. And so it gets a little confusing about what are you talking about, the author which, in the database or author in my... Which one is it? Yeah. And so I found out with all these underscores in my code, it was really readable. Whenever I saw the trailing underscore, I knew I'm talking about the database, not in my programming language. So I found that to be really useful. So I, uh, but yes, it's totally optional. The spec, the standard is very limited on names. It used to be only US ASCII English letters, uh, although that's not true anymore. But a lot of the databases, see the problem is the standard will change, but that doesn't mean all the databases are implementing it. Of course. So officially, you can now use international characters too. But basically, your safest if you use only English letters, underscore is the only separator, you can't use a hyphens or dots. And Long story short, if you keep everything lowercase, it's the most portable between different databases. Which is weird because the standard says just the opposite. But again, databases don't always do what the standard says. Standard says uppercase, but um, all the databases are supposed to store everything in uppercase, but they don't. Yeah? Uh, is there any virtue or vice to going from general to specific? I'm, I'm thinking you've got author, you've got students. They're both people. You know, wouldn't it be better, you know, uh, Oh, well, I have this dividing line, so I kind of make those be two different sample, two different databases. Right. But, but you're, you're still making a valid point that sometimes you have, like, uh, employees versus uh, contact people. Uh -huh. So might you consolidate some of that stuff? Uh, that's kind of an advanced topic. I'd oh, okay. rather talk about separate. All right. Because uh, there are pros and cons in times where you do and times where you don't. Gotcha. Um, and... That's part of the skill and talent of being a developer and a DBA is to figure out the nuance. You have to understand the business problem to mm -hmm. understand if those things are really, really different or if they're kind of the same. Gotcha. So it's kind of like, uh, isn't that on uh, Sesame Street? What are these things? Or two of these things are kind of the same. They used to do a little thing for the kids. Uh, and that's a lot of what you do in development work is trying to understand the business problem and tear it apart in a really specific way because a lot of times the business people don't Humans tolerate ambiguity really well. So business people, you know, uh, can kind of blur these things together and it all works out. But when you're doing a database, you have to get really precise in your definitions because you're going to put them in one table or another. So that's actually a really tricky question, what you asked. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you define these columns, um, we're putting data into each one of these there's actually not a word for this actual value. You can say value or kind of cell. From the, it's kind of like a spreadsheet in that we've got rows and columns. You could call it a cell. Generally, it's called a value. Um, but anyway, we, we can store different kinds of data in different columns. Now, these three I happen to be showing you are all basically text. But there are other kinds of data that you can store. And what's cool about databases is that they're smart and that they can understand different kinds of data have meaning in different ways. And what I mean is, for example, if they're numbers, then the database knows how to sort them. And basically what we're talking about is searching and sorting. So if it knows it's text, the database can help you figure out with, uh, should it be case sensitive or not case sensitive? Should we you know, care about uppercase versus lowercase or not? If we, and if you want to alphabetize, how do you alphabetize? Uh, you know, does uppercase come before or after lowercase? What about accented characters in other languages? So databases are built to be smart about the kinds of data that you're storing. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the data types. Because that's the next step when you build a database. After you've got your entities, which are your tables, and then you figure out what are your attributes, those are the columns, then you need to figure out exactly what kind of data are we going to store in those columns. So. Uh, what I'm showing here, again, the SQL standard uh, defines some of these, a small subset of them, but all databases have more than the standard requires. So 
The standard has char and var char, which is short for character and variable, variable length character. Um, because the character type, what it does is to pad out. If you put in, like my name Basil is five letters long, if you put it in a column and you say it's 10 maximum wide, it'll pad in the last five with spaces. So um, in modern systems, we don't tend to do that anymore. It used to be more efficient when computers were a lot more limited. Varchar says, let's, uh, let's only store, if the name is B-A-S-I-L, let's only store five letters. Let's not stick in five more spaces. Postgres has a type. All databases have their own types as well as the standard ones. So Postgres has one just called text. Because in Postgres, this behavior really is this behavior. And um, both of these, you put in a maximum length. Uh, with this text, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so if you are only using Postgres, I would just say use text and don't even worry about the details. If you might cross databases, use other databases, then you'd want to learn to use these two. This clob is for character large object, and this is for huge amounts of data, because usually these database types are limited to like 64 characters or 256 characters. I think Postgres is our, um, oh, Postgres is our kind of unlimited, but some databases are not. So clob is the type in some databases for when you have like, I want to put my whole book in that one field. Um, integers, the integer types, integer means that it's a whole number, there's no fraction on the end, and uh, small int and int and big int are all about how, what range of numbers you can put in it. So these are basically, uh, these are usually 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit, which means int is kind of the common one, because that's up to uh, two to four, plus or minus two billion. The small int I can't remember, but if you're doing like a person's age, you know, or how many pets does somebody have, you can use small int, because uh, you know you're not in the billions. Big int is for humongous numbers. 64-bit is gazillions. Uh, so you rarely use that uh, in most apps, most business apps at least. In science, it might be more common. There are fractional, if you did, this is a whole number. If you have fractional numbers, then you can use these other types. Um, uh, and there are two types here, which people who are novices are going to be surprised to learn, that this type approximate fractions are what is also called floating point. Floating point is a technology that handles fractional numbers, but you are trading away accuracy for speed. So, and that's usually used by default in a lot of software. So uh, this can even bite you, even if you're like trying to calculate your mortgage in a spreadsheet. Um, the spreadsheets are usually using floating point technology. So you'll find when you're doing calculation on the life of a mortgage, it's $100,000, you get to the end and total it, and it's not exactly 100,000. And you total up all the pieces. Because the actual fractions will have a little tiny bit of error on the end. But it's not really an error, it's a trade away because they're really fast to calculate. So this is really important because you do not use these types if you're tracking money in a database. Um, same issue happens in programming languages. Um, some programming languages are, are very limited, and you only get floating point numbers, and then you got a problem, and handling money is not going to work well. Uh, in databases, you're going to use uh, the numerical decimal type if you're handling money, uh, or any time you care about accuracy. Even though it's going to be slower to calculate, uh, it's going to be accurate numbers. Um, but this stuff is often used, for example, science and engineering, where they want speed of calculations and they know there's a tiny little error in the, we're talking like, if it's, if it's, you know, we're talking like after 12 digits of decimal, you know, some tiny little number's gonna be wrong. Uh, the other types, there's a whole bunch of other types. These are uh, just a few I picked out that are often useful. Um, there's Boolean, which is just true or false. There is uh, date time, there's a whole bunch of date time related ones. I just gave another talk on that um, at this conference actually. Uh, UUID is uh, very interesting because it uh, stands for universally unique ID. It's basically, you can think of it as a very large number. Whereas this is a uh, big end, I said the 64 bit, this is actually 128 bit. So it's a gigantic range of possible values but it's often used where you want to give uh, an ID number or name to stuff 
without having to check into some central coordinated place. So, and it's a standard. So you can have different software libraries that are creating data, assigning them a, a UUID. You can consolidate that data later with others and you know it's still gonna be unique. Basically, it's a date, time, a random number, plus uh, the MAC address. There's an uh, address on every Ethernet card. So if you just put all that together, you're not gonna have collisions between uh, different computers. Um, in fact, I first got attracted to Postgres because it does support UUIDs as a data type. Uh, there's ge geometry. Postgres has this. There's a bunch of uh, like geometric shapes. So Postgres can actually know the meaning of the shapes. Uh, there's actually a type for network and network administrators who have to put in uh, like internet protocol numbers, IP numbers. They actually have a data type for that, which means it can tell if the number is valid or not valid. So that's one of the reasons we use databases, they can reject invalid data. Um, the, uh, there's an array, when you have a whole collection of values that you only care about all together. So you're not gonna search for individual values. So for example, if you're a scientific instrument that gathered a bunch of data, it's one, one set of data, and you want all those numbers or whatever they are together, there's an array type for that. There's bits, which is the same idea, but it's a whole, basically a collection of Booleans, a whole bunch of uh, true, false, true, false all together. Um, there's JSON and XML, which you might have heard of. You know, XML is uh, got the tags like HTML. JSON is just another way to do the same thing. The um, I'm old enough now to see the industry loves to reinvent things. So we got XML working, and then a decade later we got to reinvent it and do it all over again as JSON. Uh, Postgres actually supports both of these data types, and if you use either of these, talk to me or some guys in the booth, because um, Postgres has some amazing support for JSON. Uh, data. PostGIS is for geographic information. So, you know, this all like geolocation on your phone or the stuff where on a map, like where are the flood areas in this city going to be if the river rises, all that kind of how you define the contours and the places. That is, um, Postgres is actually industry leading on that. There's a whole module you add onto Postgres called PostGIS for Geo Info Systems. Um, and then there's, I got an ellipsis here because there's a whole bunch more types. So these are not all standard. Like I said, a lot of these are particular to uh, certain databases. So this is a challenge. When you're starting out for the first time, you're going to feel a little overwhelmed. You know, once you've got your tables uh, and your attributes identified, it's going to take a little work to figure this out. And that's often a good time to talk to somebody else and get a little help on it. Yeah? Uh, how about user-defined data types? Yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I think uh, that means multiple things. You can define your own data type. One of the easiest ways to do that is to have a, to find a domain. So, for example, we sell chairs, and chairs only come in dusty rows and periwinkle and whatever. I'm making up those names in the catalogs. <laughs> so we, orange, yeah, yeah, and burnt orange. We only sell those three things. So I don't want somebody putting in the database red. So we can define a domain that's only periwinkle, dusty rose, and burnt orange. And then again, the database will enforce that as a rule. So if data's coming in and it says red, the database will not accept it and bounce it out. And again, that's a major reason why we're using a database. I kind of think of this as like um, the forts with the walls around them, layers of defense. So your app is like your first, the data entry part of your app is the first level of defense, right? If somebody puts in red, it should get rejected while they're typing. <laughs> but what if it gets past that form? Well, hopefully later in your app it does some sort of validation on the whole set of data. But what if that goes wrong? Well, then it sends it to the database. So this is my, like my last level of defense, is my database engine itself. Mm -hmm. Is yes, it's very powerful to define those rules there. And what's also cool is sometimes you might not use the regular app. You might bring in data from somewhere else, like import text. And again, that same rule will apply. If red is in there, it'll get bounced out. Oh, well, there's the slide. Make your own data type. <laughs> there it is. That's what I was just talking about. Couldn't remember if I covered it or not. There is a command called create type that's more complicated, but for beginners, I'll just mention domain. And you don't have to do this right away. You can just have a text field and call it color on your product table. But um, down the road, you're probably going to want to, uh, well, probably the first time you get red in there or orange instead of burnt orange, then you're going to go, oh, maybe we should put up a wall of defense and define a domain. So this is an object in the database, is a domain, and then you attach it to the field. 
So you go into the, you create a domain and you say these are the values for it. And I think that I, should, yeah, right there. Create domain. And then I give it a name. I give it a data type. And then I say check. These are called check constraints. So we're saying we're going to constrain our data when it comes in that it has to pass this check test. I want to check that the value that's coming in is either pumpkin, periwinkle, or seafoam. And um, as I said, it's, it, the whole point of that is that later, if we do an insert into this table, TBL is whatever your table name is, like product. And I'm, on the color column, I'm putting in the value dusty rose. Well, that's not pumpkin, periwinkle, or seafoam, so it should be booted out. So this would fail. Is the 20 on bar chart the maximum amount of characters? Yeah, I said earlier on the charm bar chart, you can set a limit to the width. Uh, the length that would be stored. And again, if you want to, this is the most common type, so I don't mind talking about it uh, in detail because, uh, like I said, it's, it's what you'll use most often is text. Um, uh, again, if you are going concerned about using different kinds of databases besides Postgres, use Varchar. If you're only using Postgres, just use text. Um, so the way a SQL, uh, SQL is an acronym for structured query language. There are other kinds of databases. Uh, I used one for decades that is a relational database, which relational means we can have multiple tables and the tables are connected, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a minute. Um, so there are relational databases then. Most of those nowadays are all SQL, but not necessarily. So SQL is a particular language, it's a set of commands. We just saw those commands I was just reading out. Um, but the concept that you need to understand is that the database is a black box. So we don't know what's inside the black box, we don't care. So the way it stores the data and organizes it on disk, uh, the way that they uh, build, the way that they access the data is not our business. So, being an app developer or a user, that's here's our user or developer, she's out here. She's asking for data when she's putting in data and getting data back. But over there in the Postgres box, I don't know what's going on in there. Uh, and I don't care. That's kind of the whole point to a database engine is that we uh, don't have to track our data manually. If you don't have a database system, what you're doing is, what she's going to be doing here is writing out text files. Uh, or some kind of making up her own files, which I'm old enough to have done myself, uh, major pain in the rear because organizing that data, figuring out how to insert data in the middle of it, how to add new data, it's, that's all the work that is now coded in a database so that we don't have to manage it ourselves. So we're giving up responsibility and power and control, but we're getting back all that ease of not having to worry about managing data. Oh, the other thing about SQL is that if you've done any programming at all, you know, programming is quite tedious in that you have to tell the computer, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this. It's kind of like instead of telling your kid, go brush your teeth, it's like telling your kid, okay, I want you to walk into this room, take two steps in, turn to the sink, raise your hand, you know, that's what you do in a normal computer, right? Declarative is, just go brush your teeth. And you don't care how the kid does it, you don't care uh, even how long it takes, all you know is that the teeth are going to get brushed. Um, although it may not work with a kid, but it does work with SQL. You just say, <laughs> select, you know, I want select customers who are in the state of Washington. And uh, it's very cool because, like I said, I've done it the other way. Without a SQL database, then you are writing pages and pages of code to try to manipulate data. With SQL, one little line of select customers whose state is Washington, and you're done. So this is, if you're used to other programming, this is a big uh, paradigm shift you know, in the way you think, because uh, you're not going to do all the nitty gritty. So we talked about having, uh, creating your table, defining your data, uh, or your table that's going to store. This is like the template or the cookie cutter before you get the cookies. Uh, so we have to define our the shape. And this is example syntax. This is actually abbreviated, there's usually more in the real world. But the basic idea is we're going to do a create table, give it a table name, and then we're going to use parentheses. Every SQL statement should end in a semicolon. A lot of people get out of this habit, because if you're only running one line, you can get away without it. But I would encourage you to always make a habit of adding the 
semicolon, because they can bite you later if you don't. Um, and then we're just saying, okay, we've got a field. This is a dorm room, so the dorm room uh, unit, we could call it a room, and then we would uh, text, uh, text type capacity, how many students can we assign to that room, like two. Uh, and that's basically it, it's very simple. This is called, this creating of the table is called DDL for short, you'll hear that phrase, which means data definition language. There is also DNL, which is when you're uh, manipulating the data, when you're adding the students to the dorm, when you're adding books, adding authors, or deleting the authors, they quit, uh, that's DML. DDL means we're actually changing the structure of the database itself. The other task that you do, um, uh, oh, more DDL is adding a column or dropping a column. Um, some databases you can even change the data type on the column. Um, indexing, indexing is all about speed of access. So if you do, normally here, if we go searching for ISBN numbers in a whole long list of books, uh, it's what's it's done by what's called sequential search. It just starts the first book with the number, goes to the next book, and it actually has to load the entire record. All of that data gets loaded off the disk into memory just to pull out the ISBN and see if it matches your um, the one number that you're looking for. What an index does, it's just like well, you probably don't know, but anybody older knows libraries used to have a card catalog. So if you want to look up a book, you didn't go traipse through the whole big library. You went up to the little tiny card catalog, and it had a little card that represented the book. So it had an excerpt of the book. It had the title, the author, and maybe a subject. That's what an index does for you, is that it copies, if we index this ISBN column, it copies the ISBN data, puts it somewhere else in the database engine, and then uh, because it's compact, it doesn't have all the rest of the data, we can now scan that list much, much faster. So one of the things you'll do is, um, you don't need to do it when you're beginning, if you're just playing around, but when you're getting more serious and are gonna deploy something, if you're gonna have a lot of data in that table, a lot of books or a lot of dorm rooms, then you're gonna wanna index the columns that you search on a lot. That's just another big challenge you're gonna take on. Uh, and that's it, when you're defining the structure, a lot of what helps you is to either look at paper forms or imagine you're doing a paper form. And all those pieces of data, those are usually going to be columns on that table. Any questions on that? Yeah. Okay, it, 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 it strikes me that, okay, you, you, you've, got, you've got your book, you've got title, SBN, so you, oh, description. Uh, okay, so, so you want to you know, uh, create the option of making a list by title versus a list by SB, uh, uh, ISBN. What do you mean a list by, you mean an index? Right, right, right. Ah, yes, you can index two columns or three or more, right. Right, 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 and it strikes me that there's you know, a couple ways of doing that. One is to take whatever arrangement exists and then search for the next thing, you know, as you, as, as you put it up, or create links between objects so that all you have to do is follow uh, the links. You're talking about the mechanics of how you ma manipulate the index to use yeah. it or build it? Right, right. Not my problem, I don't care. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. That is the job of the database. Gotcha, okay. Yes. And again, you asked, that's a whole huge area of technology on how you build indexes. And okay. actually, in Postgres, there are different types of indexes for different kinds of data. Um, uh, although, um, just usually you're indexing text and it's no big deal. Uh, but like the GIS, there's ways to index geographic information. So um, it's, it's a specialized kind of index. So all of that is like a huge topic. But again, in the end, I don't care. As a developer, it's like I just say I want an index and it's done. Okay. Does that, does that help? So again, it's a declarative language. I just say select book where ISBN equals XYZ123. And then I don't care how it finds it. I don't care if there's an index or not. The only difference is speed. If there's mm -hmm. millions of books, it might take minutes or seconds to find my book for one ISBN number. If it's indexed, it'll probably take a split second. Right. right. So it's speed. That's the, the only reason I care as a developer or a user is speed. That's the only reason why I'm indexing or not indexing. Okay. Yeah, and I don't want to index because uh, why don't we just index everything, right? Well, the reason is, for one thing, you're duplicating all that data. It's got to be duplicated out into the other index. The other is, every time you insert a record, the indexes have to be updated. 
And I used to, like when I was her age, you go to the library, you want a book, and it's in the back room because librarians haven't created the card catalogs. They had to type it on a typewriter and then walk it and alphabetize it in the tray. So they'd have a book for weeks, and I know it. I can see it sitting on the <laughs> shelf, right? But they don't have the card catalog, so they won't release it. So it's the exact same thing in a database, is that when you insert a record, it has to go to the index, and there's whole issues about locking. You know, two records can't get to the same index at the very same moment. So there can be a little backlog, just like the books in the library. There can be a little backlog. Uh, we're all talking usually split second, mm -hmm. but still it's an issue. And if you've got a lot of data changes, you don't want to have indexes on everything because you're slowing down that inserting or deleting of rows. So that's the question of why don't we just index everything. Uh, the other thing is if you have a very small number of records, uh, I mean even a dorm, you know, you've got several hundred students. If it's one dorm that you're tracking, you don't need to index it because uh, what happens is that data is in memory. And that's the other thing a database does for you is it manages the efficiency. So the data is stored on disk, so that you can shut down your computer and still keep all your students and books. But um, uh, while it's running, it reads the data off that disk into memory and it caches it. So as an administrator, again, when you use Postgres, Postgres has some nice defaults, you don't have to worry about it. But uh, when you get really serious or have huge amounts of data, you might tune your engine. And tuning means changing settings, like how much of my memory on my computer do I want to dedicate to Postgres? I think the default is it takes a quarter of the memory. Like if you have a 16 gig machine, I think Postgres will take four gigs and claim four gigs as its own. And so it's keeping a copy of four gigs worth of data and indexes in memory. So what's cool is that again, as a developer, I don't have to manage that. It's like Postgres is already optimized to know when to, when to store like it. Uh, it'll store the most recently used stuff and when stuff isn't used very often, it'll let it drop out of memory if memory's filling up because it knows it's stored on disk. So it's cool. Again, all that, I don't have to worry about. So now if we've done our tasks of setting up our whole data structure, and we did our DDL, it's define the structure, now we're ready to enter data. There's a term, one of my favorite terms is called CRUD in the programming world. And it's just an acronym for create, read, update, delete. Because that's usually your job, most database type apps. You're going to create records. You're going to read them after you've inserted them in the database. You're going to update them after they're already in there, and you're going to delete them. So you'll hear programmers say, you've done the CRUD screen for the student table. And all that means is we've got to get some basic uh, forms for letting people enter data and delete data. Now in C so now I'm going to map that to the SQL commands. So this is just the generic terminology. Specific to SQL, creating data, we use insert. And reading data is the select command. When you're modifying data, you use update. Delete, there's multiple ones. And by the way, the cool thing about SQL is it's a very small little language. So I mean, these, these are the four words you're going to use the most, more than anything else. Uh, delete is a little, there's uh, the issue of delete is one row or a bunch of rows that meet a, um, sorry, I can't remember the technical words predicate, a test. Like, Delete all the customers whose state is Washington. You could do that. So the predicate is, you know, where state equals Washington. And that delete will delete one customer or many customers. Truncate, sometimes what you want is to, uh, you've got a million and you only want half a million rows. You've got a million rows in there, you only want half a million. You can just say truncate half a million. And it'll just chop off the, the last, the, uh, everything after the first half a million, it'll chop off which is kind of obscure, you don't use it a lot, but sometimes in science and stuff you'll do that. Uh, we have data sets you know you can get rid of. Drop means to kill entirely. So it's a drop table uh, or drop column, I think. Um, so drop table means delete the entire table definition and all the data with it. And drop a column means to just delete the one column, but you're also deleting all the data that was stored in all the rows for that. Uh, this is all DML. So this is our D data manipulation I was talking about. So we're changing the contents of the tables. We're not changing the, the table structure. And we have transactions for this. A transaction means what if we did delete customer where state equals Washington because we're not going to do business in Washington anymore. What if we had uh, a thousand customers? We're getting through 500, 501, 502, and at 503 somebody trips over the power cord on the server computer and kills our Postgres database. 
or what if uh, any number of other things go wrong on the computer. Uh, what a transaction does is to roll back. If anything goes wrong, you won't get just some of the customers deleted. That's the, that's the whole purpose of a transaction is saying, I want all of this to happen or none of it to happen. And in a database, it's almost always what you want. So uh, if, if, if we got to 503 out of 1,000 customers deleted, I don't want the 497 left in there. What will happen is um, the magic, the way this happens, is that in Postgres, there's a what's called a write-ahead log, a WAL, you hear the term wall file. And what it means is Postgres writes the, the instructions and the data changes into a file, a log file, then it does it to the database. So what happens is it writes the wall file, and if something happens in the middle of actually deleting the data, it knows there's an internal record keeping. It knows that the wall file instruction was not completed. So when you boot up Postgres again, it will see that that transaction was not uh, completed and roll back uh, or try again. So again, this is one of the benefits of using a database, is that you're not getting, if you're just that programmer and she's trying to manipulate these files, if her app crashes in the middle of it, she's got a half ruined file. So unless she was smart, maybe duplicated the whole file and then made it, you know. But even then, you usually duplicate a file, give it a different name, go do your work on the first file, and then you change the file names. You know, all that business. The database is doing all that for you with this transaction rollback business. Yeah? Can you roll back after the commit? Mm, um, I was going to say no, but uh, there is a concept of nested transactions. And I don't recall what Postgres does for that. Okay. I can't remember. I've worked in too many products, so I can't remember offhand. But yes, there is a concept of nested tra transaction within another transaction. And that is, oh, I think they call it a something point, um, like a rollback point or something like that. Okay. So yeah, you can do a partial rollback in some systems and probably in Postgres. I can't remember. Um, yeah, tra um, you know, most of the time you're just doing a simple one transaction, but for example, financial stuff is often where you've got to like, you're updating some of the basic data for like accrual accounting, but then you have to go update some ledger books, and so you might want to roll back part of it. If something goes wrong with the ledger book, you might want to keep the first part you already did and then try something else. Yeah, so there are times where a transaction in a transaction makes sense. So how, what's the syntax for the actual wording of your SQL statement or adding data? Insert into, then we refer to the title, and then in parentheses we put the columns that we want. And this is a little awkward because down here is the values. So you've got to map that this first fruit at the bottom is the title, and this uh, is uh, uh, the title. So this one is this uh, ISBN number. So you've got to get this ordering to match up, or else you're not, this is going to error out when you try running it. By the way, a um, little trivia, SQL language was actually developed by IBM for the purpose of end users. So they imagined that managers and secretaries were going to type all this out as a way to interact with the database. That never happened. So uh, I'm showing you some simple stuff, but SQL gets more complicated. But even in this simple one, as I just said, you've got to get this ordering right, and it's like, you know, this is not easy to do. You can't really have line managers and data entry people doing that. So normally this is always happening as a, uh, you know, you're writing an app of some kind in some programming language that is writing out this SQL and then sending it to the database to be executed. So you're not writing this out. I'm, I'm saying this is hard to line up, but you only got to get it right once, right? Once it's in your app, then you're done. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I would think that at some times you would want synonyms. You know, yes. Uh, you, know, you know, because, okay, your, your user can't remember crimson and puts in scarlet instead. Oh, you mean for the values? Yeah. That's the business of your app. So your app, for example, you could have a pop-up menu, so they're not typing in burnt mm -hmm. orange. It's okay. on a list, a pop-up of three colors. So they're choosing burnt, burnt orange. That's the job of the app, to make data entry easy. Right, right. I thought you're headed another way, which mm. is, um, I'm not showing it today, but often in uh, 
complicated longer SQL statements, you're using the table name or, and the column name over and over and over again. So at the top, you can actually say, you know, um, um, uh, untaxed products for export is the name of the table. You can say as X. Mm -hmm. So you put in the name once as X, and then all the rest of the SQL, you can have X as the whatever you want, whatever short name. And that's the short, it's just a way to shorten it. It's just an alias or a, what was your word? A synonym. synonym. Yeah, it's just a synonym for the table name. And you only do that when you have really long SQL, so it's not that. I mean, it's kind of common. Um, let's see. So after we added that row, that insert into our command to get the data in, how do we get the data out? That's the query. Query is the usual verb for this. And in SQL, the command is select from. So select what columns do we want. And the star is a shortcut, uh, shortcut for all the columns. So if we do select from book, we're going to get all three columns that we defined earlier. Now, alternatively, we could just say select title from book, and we'd only get this one column in the data coming out of the database. There's a shortcut in Postgres. Most people don't even know. Uh, it's just called table. So this is, this is SQL standard. This is Postgres specific. Uh, you just say table book and boom, you get all the rows for all the columns. Oh yeah, and notice that both of these were getting all the rows. So we didn't put on a where clause at the end, um, which I kind of talked about a couple of times. We could qualify this and say, only give me the books uh, you know, that have a certain description or you know, have FR, the name starts with FR. I'm going to show you that in a moment. Uh, oh, right there, select where. So. Um, here we are, select, I want all the columns, but I only want one row. So where the title is, fruit at the bottom. Um, but here's the like I was just saying, is that you could say, select all the columns from the book table where like. So fruit, I'm going to get fruit at the bottom and fruitcake and fruition. Any of the rows that, that are going to meet that, uh, any of the titles that have those kind of values are going to get picked up. This syntax is like, but notice there's a little uh, percent sign. Uh, oh, the other thing notice is we're using single quotes here. These single quote marks is what we use in SQL. So you will definitely make the mistake there using double quotes, mm -hmm. and you'll get errors. Um, and we're in, so normally this means a string literal, meaning literally exactly these letters. This is a exception to that. This is a wild card when we use the percent sign with the like. So, so, so what is the um, thing that gives you you know, if you, if you want to put the percent sign into the, uh, uh, into the title. Oh, you can escape that. So escaping okay. is when you put some mark, which I can't remember, like a back tick or maybe another mm -hmm. quote or double, uh, two single quotes. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, okay. there, yeah, if there's a percent that's in the value that you're looking for, you'll need to escape that. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say something else. The, uh, oh, this syntax, by the way, if you notice I'm wrapping these on different lines, SQL is all, doesn't care about white space. So you can have spaces before or after these words. Uh, you can have all this on one line of text or multiple lines. It's all up to you. Um, you'll see a lot of people do this, including me. They tend to break this out because uh, it gets a little hard to read. All of this, it's so compact, right? You're doing so much that you got to really pay attention to all the parts. I find it's usually best to have every one of these major words on its own line. Some people like me put the semicolon at the end. Um, or you put it at the end, or some people leave it off, which I don't recommend. Um, so anyway, that's all. That's it's all a matter of taste. Uh, t t t whoops, what did I do? Oh, here, here. Instead of star, we're doing the uh, column. As I said earlier, we could say just I just want the title. That's all I'm going to get back. So all your data is still there in the database. It's just that what comes back to your app is only going to be this one column. You know, I didn't put it in here, but the other thing you can do, I'm not going to dwell on it today, but you can also get stuff that's not exactly your data from the database. You can do calculations and get them back. So for example, you could have a birth date, and you could say select and then call a function that calculates the age given the birth date for today's date. So you could call a little piece of code that actually generates a value, and that's the value you get back. 
So I'll just plant that seed in your head is that you're not always just working with literally what's stored in the database. You can actually generate other kinds of results. Um, for example, in the real world for product, that color stuff, those might, those, they might store those as number values or as um, abbreviations, you know, uh, BO for burnt orange. So when you return that data, you probably don't want to see BO, 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 you might want to see burnt orange. So you could run a little routine that um, expands that value when you select it. So, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So how do we get, remember I said we got the black box and we got these select statements, which are just text, by the way. This is uh, this kind of stuff, this syntax here, this is just plain text. There's no magic to it. So when you're writing apps in some language, you usually literally create this as a piece of text and then send it as a piece of text to the database. How do you send it to the database? That's the next thing. There's almost always going to be a driver or a library that's between you. Well, there's all, always is with a straight SQL database engine. There's something in between you and the actual Postgres or whatever database engine. So one common way to get started, if you're savvy with the terminal, if you're a Linux BSD kind of person and you love using the terminal, you can go at it with using in Postgres. Uh, when you install Postgres, you will get a little utility called PSQL. Um, I don't even know what the P stands for, but it's, it's the app that you're running in your console. So you launch PSQL, and now your command line will change to recognize commands uh, that you are sending uh, in SQL to the engine. Behind PSQL is there's a little library. There's a C library written in programming language, programming language C. Uh, PSQL is interacting with that to uh, talk to the database, and then when the data comes back, convert it to something that you can show on the terminal. So uh, another option, if you're not so savvy like me, I'm not that comfortable with the command line most of the time, I'd rather use a, uh, a GUI app, graphical app. Um, PG Admin uh, is another tool that you get with Postgres for free. It's funny with it, usually. Um, uh, it stands for admin is short for administrator, like DBA is database administrator. So it means we want to mess with, it's like the back door into the database. We want to define the tables and maybe interact with them. Um, so this, the current version of PG Admin, uh, PG Admin 4, which by the way, it's a little, it's brand new, it's a little clunky, it has issues. So it's great, given that it's free, it's worth every penny you paid for. But um, there are a lot of other tools. But getting started, I would definitely recommend PG Admin, unless you really like command line, use PSQL. But it's, it's good enough to get you started, but you may want to use other tools down the road. But anyway, PG Admin 4 has been rewritten to be in Python, and they are actually running a web server inside of it. So the idea is what they used to have before was one app if you were local, and then they had this web app thing that you could connect to Postgres across a network. What they did is merge them together. So if you're on the same machine, they open up a window, but inside it is actually just a web page content. So, um, um, and that's all written in Python with a little web server, and then they're using some Python library that is connecting to the uh, database engine. What I do in my work is I write Vodden apps, which are Java-based on the server side, but they render in HTML. So on my server side, I'm running Java, and I am using JDBC. JDBC is an acronym for uh, Java Database Connectivity. So there's a whole standard way that Java drivers are written for various different databases. So I'm using a JDBC driver that is specific to Postgres. So there's always something between you and your engine. And as I said, apps tend to, uh, the job of an app is get the data out of the database and then present it to the user in some way that's appropriate. So for, this is a, a screenshot of a Vaadin um, table that was built in HTML. So Vaadin builds the HTML for me. So in Java, I said, go get this data, use my JDBC driver, pull the data into memory on my server, <coughs> my app server, and then I might want to massage it with Java and then have Vaadin display it on the screen. So Vaadin is doing things like providing features like to click and sort this column list. Um, which could, as the app developer, I could either sort the records that I already have in memory, or maybe I want to go back to the database and get fresh data and sort it, and have the database sort it, or uh, just, get, just make sure I got the latest data. 
that's another issue to think about is when you're dealing with an app, it's always a step away from the database. So you now have stale data, right? The moment you make that select query, you got data back. <coughs> a moment later, somebody else could be changing that data in the database. So your app is always just a little stale, right? It's not the data, it's a copy of the data you got out of the database. Uh, oh, and by the way, these blank bars, you don't see them on the screen well, but this is actually a box to type in and filter values. So you could type in ART and get Arthur and eliminate the display of these team you. Again, that's the job of the app. You may or may not go back to the database to just get the authors, but for example, this bottom tool will automatically suppress the display of the ones that don't meet that criteria. I don't know how new you guys are to app development, so I'm just trying to give you the concepts. So the next big issue to talk about is we're getting back all these rows. How do we know which row is which? Because I just said we're getting a copy of them. What if this Arthur is he's European, uh, and so he is Arthur without an H in it. What if that was a misspelling, and we need to update the H uh, is missing and it should be changed? So we need to find which one of these have his name, but it's this record. I know it's not some other Arthur. So how do I know which one of these rows is the row in the database? And that is an issue of identity. How do I identify each row? And in a database, you always have a primary key, which simply means this is a column on this table, and I know uh, that it has a value that is unique, meaning there are no other rows with that value. And because it's unique, it means that I know that I can always use it to track this one record. So, what happens in an app often is that when you have this displayed, there's often another column that's just not displayed that is the primary key value. So in the real world, I, would, I could have click on here and have an edit button, and they click the edit, and they want to change the name. Well, when they click the edit button, I notice which row was selected, and I go into the hidden column, and I pull out that primary key value. So that's how I know which number identifies that guy. So, uh, this is critical. This is absolutely critical. Every table you're going to figure out a primary key. Uh, yeah, so how do you do that? What kind of data is going to be in that extra column? Well, you don't have to have an extra, extra column in the database. If you have a value in your data, that already could make sense to use as an identifier. So for example, employees, every company gives out a badge and they've got an employee ID number on it. So the company has already generated a unique identifier for that employee. So this is what's called a natural key. Natural meaning it's already in my data, I don't need to do anything. I just need to tell Postgres, oh, employee ID, make that my primary key. Um, the problem with this is, this is also a big debate whether to do a natural key or not. It's a big debate. You, you know, over beers always get uh, DBA programmers riled up. I'm in the camp that this has never ever worked for me in the real world because data, the data always changes, and you don't want your key changing. Uh, it's kind of like, would you want the apartment number on your apartment changing? Oh, every couple of years, you're now you're in 18, now you're in 17. No, that would drive you nuts, right? It's the ID is so important to the whole rest of the database system which we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, the other places you're using that ID. So I found employee ID, oh great, until you merge with another company. So now, all whoever bought who, those employees lose their old employee number, get a new ID number, so all your data now is wrong. Uh, company names have changed on me. I mean, everything. Uh, identifier for campuses or buildings or locations around the country, those things change, they get redefined by somebody. So I'm in the camp where I never use a natural key. I use what's called the surrogate key, where I am adding an extra column to the database just for the purpose of identifying it. So then the question is, well, what kind of data am I going to stick into that field? And usually there's two types. It's either a number, a sequence, you start at one, or you can start at a thousand, thousand one, thousand two, 1,002, whatever, whatever makes sense. Um, uh, for example, if you had employee IDs already, you might just start with those, but not depend on them in the future. Um, oh, and the great thing is, databases all have a sequence generating feature in them. 
So this is important because databases by their nature are multi-user. You rarely have a system that only has one person using it all the time. So what happens if Susan is inserting a record and so she's getting a unique ID of four, Bob goes in there and inserts one that is five, only now Susan had a problem with her transaction and it rolled back. So what, you, you need to worry about the conflicts of the numbers. You don't want four being handed out twice. So that's the job of the sequence generator is that it's transaction savvy because it's inside Postgres. So it knows not to give out four twice. It knows to give out four to Susan and five to Bob. If the transaction rolls back, it knows uh, you lose the number. It doesn't go back in the pot, uh, at least not in Postgres. I don't think in most systems. So uh, that's why this is not usually used for something like an invoice number. Auditors don't want to see missing invoice numbers. So it's completely legit as a database guy. It's completely legit to have three, uh, <coughs> four, skip five, skip six, and go to seven because five and six got rolled back in a transaction. So um, it's good for an ID, but it's not good for uh, like an invoice number type thing. Yeah? Suppose you have a record within a record. Should your uh, uh, sequence number reflect that? We're not going to talk a lot. I'm going to give you some basics maybe here about what's called normalization. Normalization is about not having a table inside a table. You shouldn't oh, okay. have nested data inside it. Yeah, that's a whole other topic which I would love to talk about. We have the rest of the <laughs> afternoon if you want to talk about it. Not there, there are some very basic rules to normalization, but yet you should not have data. The whole, does, the whole goal of normalizing a relational database is you pull out data into separate tables. You don't cram stuff together, which is a learned skill because it's kind of counterintuitive to, as I said, humans, um, human intelligence is really good at tolerating the ambiguity, so we can kind of cram all kinds of things in our mind. But we have to separate them out, make them very strict, as I said, the whole point of a database is it's structured, very well structured to find. We're, all, we're going to touch a little bit on that in a, a little bit shortly. The other way to identify besides the serial number, uh, sequence number is UUID, which I mentioned earlier. It's a unique identifier. It's much bigger. These you can often get away with a 32-bit number, up to 2 billion. Um, so that would mean this is four times bigger. So the UUIDs are not as efficient. But I like them uh, for a lot of reasons, but where they're really critical is when you have data coming from different places. Like somebody was just talking to me today about uh, working with university researchers doing fisheries tracking. So uh, some gal in Oregon is tracking uh, jellyfish and wash you dub, they're tracking salmon. They, if they want to share data, if they both have records named numbered one and numbered one and number two and number two, you can't merge their data together. That's a great time to be using UUIDs because they're generated independently, but we know we're not going to get a collision between them. And again, I love Postgres because it treats UUID as a data type. And as I said earlier, it's an address, it's a moment in space and time, a point on the clock plus that one particular computer identifier and a little random number, and then you'll never have collisions. So this is super important, so I want to make sure you guys all get it. Um, primary key is totally critical to a database. If you did have <coughs> that problem where the primary key was the same, could you make a new column that's a different primary primary key? Well, that's what this gal was telling me about because she got all this data, right, that was right. not well merged together. It wasn't built to be merged together. So yes, what she would do is she would import those records and she would have a, a column uh, that would not be the primary key but it would say this is the scientist's identifier, okay. and then she would add a whole column of her own that is her primary key. So she's got two like sequence numbers or two U. Well, if they use U IDs, they wouldn't have had a problem. But yeah, typically people are using sequence numbers. So U dub has a one two three four. So does the gal in Oregon. She's got one two three four. So what we do is store that in one column, but we set aside a new column. By not being, um, I haven't talked about it yet, but a primary key when, uh, is automatically marked as um, unique, is an attribute, meaning I don't, I want the database to make sure that I don't enter duplicate values on this column. So a primary key automatically is marked as unique. So if you try to put in one, the first one will go in. So the first salmon record from the UW guy will go in, then the first jellyfish record from the gal in Oregon is gonna come in as one, if it was primary key, you'd get an error. So you'd find out real fast. Um, 
But so what she would do is store those in a column that is not unique, not the primary key, and now we can have duplicates across the rows. Uh, that's the fun of being a programmer DBA guy is managing these kind of weird data problems. Because you know what, business people, don't worry about this. <laughs> the problem is business people are generating data and they don't think about these little nuances. Yeah? So, 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 so would it make sense to have two keys, a sequential for Russ feed and a UUID for, to, to keep things straight if you need to? Um, well, as I said, this example with the salmon fish thing, we've got one that's sort of a, it's a, primary, it's a key in their database where the data came from, right. but not in our database. Right. So no, you're always going to have one and only one primary key in each of your tables. You might have some columns in there that have meaning in other systems. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of answer it? Yeah. 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 Uh, and like I said, it, to me, in an ideal world, we'd all have UUIDs. I, I'm, see, I'm old enough that UUIDs used to be way too expensive. I mean, I started mm -hmm. in mainframe days where you did not, you could not afford 128 bits on every single record. Mm -hmm. So now we can, and I wish people took more advantage of that. You know, now we've got gigabytes on laptops, so we really can afford to have that. Um, so in an ideal world, all these scientists across these jellyfish and salmon should have all had UUIDs. We'd have no problem. And it's a standard, so it's a, it's a format that's compatible that can be generated. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm running late. You guys can always leave. Um, um, we started to. Don't be embarrassed. Huh? <laughs> we started running late. Yeah, okay. Like I said, I'm the last one, so. I think we're... You have, you have one more, actually, starting at 145. We do? Mm -hmm. On this guy's Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was last. Okay. Um, let me see. Then I'm just going to talk a little bit about... The, uh, where I said we use the keys elsewhere. And this is relating the tables. Like I said, relational ta a relational database is all about linking up these tables. And the way we do that is those prime, why do we use the word primary on key? Because there's foreign keys. So the way, if we have a customer with an invoice, how do we know which invoice belongs to which customer? Well, what we do is this, each customer has their own key value. We copy it down to the invoice. So now this invoice has its own key, so it knows itself, but now it knows the copy of the key that came from the customer. So these records are not physically tied together, but they're logically tied together. And this uh, is the, well, I was going to say the key concept, that's a bad pun. This is the key concept with relational databases. And we're running out of time, but um, you can always talk to me after, too, uh, at the booth. Um, yeah, that, this is it. Um, I was told to read database design from your mortals. Yes, it's a very good book. It's like that thing, but it really goes into it. It's pretty easy to read, yeah. yeah. And yeah. these concepts, they seem really complicated at first, but they're not. And actually, there's whole books on mathematics proving this. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, fortunately, there's some really basic rules. Yeah. And notice that this cascades down. We can have grand, I, some people like me call this parent-child-grandchild relationship. Line items on an invoice belong to this guy, then this guy belongs to the customer. So you can have primary keys that tie these different tables together. Thank you, very good. Uh-huh, great. Okay. Excellent talk, thank you very much. All right, thank you.